Thank you for having me here at uh, Drupal South Sydney 2024. I'm sorry I couldn't make it in person. Uh, today I'm talking about the history of web accessibility. So, the history of web accessibility. Uh, the first thing I would like to do is acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners of the land that uh, is uh, basically being used for the Drupal South Sydney Conference. Uh, and I just want to talk a little bit about my team. We're a little bit smaller. COVID had our way with it uh, with us. Uh, but uh, this was back in 2018 when about two thirds of us went to uh, CSUN. Uh, and one of the things that I specifically wanted to do when I started with Accessibility Oz was to basically uh, provide employment for people with disabilities as well as making the world a more accessible place. Uh, and so you can see us, we don't necessarily look like we have disabilities, uh, but at any one time I've had a staff with at least 60% of people with disabilities. I've had people with dyslexia, moderate vision impairment, epilepsy, migraines, severe vision impairment, physical impairment, post-traumatic stress disorder, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy and long COVID. Uh, the last one is uh, something that I suffer from myself. I caught COVID at CSUN in 2023 and unfortunately I'm still recovering. Uh, and the one thing to remember when it comes to accessibility is it's not just about vision impairments. A lot of people think accessibility is only about people who are blind using a screen reader, and that's absolutely not the case. In fact, the largest group of people with disabilities who use the web are people with cognitive disabilities because they're the largest group of people with disabilities. Uh, a little about me, why you should listen to me, uh, and why I'm talking about the history of accessibility. Um, I started in accessibility in 1998. I worked on the very first accessible website in Australia, which was the Vision Australia Foundation, uh, closely followed by Disability Online. Uh, and I created Australia's first automated accessibility testing tool called PurpleCop. I was an invited expert to the W3C Web Content Accessibility Guidelines version two working group. I spent six years with them. Uh, working on WCAG 2, and I also worked on the Melbourne 2006 Commonwealth Games. In fact, I, we've actually been involved in all Commonwealth Games since then, including the not happening Victoria 2026 Commonwealth Games, which uh, took us all by surprise. I spent five years managing usability and accessibility services at Monash University, and then I left in 2011 to found uh, accessibility Oz. Uh, we released Oz Player in 2012, which is our accessible video player. OzArt, our automated accessibility testing tool in 2014. I spoke at the United Nations on the importance of web accessibility in 2015, nominated for Australian of the Year in 2016, and from 2018 to now I've been chairing the ICT Mobile Site and Native App Testing Committee, talking about mobile accessibility guidelines, and I won the inaugural Australian Access Award Accessibility Person of the Year in 2019. So that's why I can talk about the history of accessibility. So the very first thing that happened uh, was the first HTML specification was released, if you want to talk about web accessibility. It was published by Tim Berners-Lee, who is uh, known as the founder of the web, also the founder of the W3C. Uh, it supported only text and it had 18 tags. The world was a lot easier to make accessible back then. Uh, and in 1995, uh, what ended up happening is uh, the Unified Website Accessibility Guidelines were released. Now, these were compiled by Greg van der Heiden, who um, has been in the industry a very long time. It was developed by people uh, in the accessibility industry with no input or direction from policy bodies. And it actually came from a discussion between Tim Berners-Lee and Mike Passiello. And Mike Passiello is a titan in the accessibility industry. Uh, Tim uh, Berners-Lee went to a pre-conference workshop run by Mike at a WWW conference talking about web accessibility. 
And because he went to that pre-conference workshop, he actually mentioned disability access in his keynote. Uh, and so the first version of the Unified Web Site Accessibility Guidelines was released in 1995 and version 8 was released in 1998 uh, and was the starting point for WCAG 1. So they managed to go through three versions, sorry, eight versions in three years. Pretty impressive. Uh, the next big thing is 1995 HTML2 was released, which uh, included support for things like images. Uh, and 1995, uh, a programming language called Mocha was released. It was written in 10 days by Brendan Ike and then renamed to LiveScript and then to JavaScript in May 1995. So uh, JavaScript as we know and love it was actually written in 10 days. 1995, the first Internet Explorer was released. Before that, we used things like uh, Netscape uh, and Opera. And that was really the beginning of the end of accessibility, I joke. Uh, but yes, Internet Explorer did make things difficult for the accessibility industry for its lax support of tags and uh, a misrendering of a lot of content. In 1997, the web, uh, the web Accessibility Initiative was created, which is a part of the W3C. And in 1997, HTML3 was released uh, and it was the first HTML specification to be published as a W3C recommendation. And they took over HTML from there. Uh, December 1997, HTML4 was released and it had three variations and this is where it got really complicated. They had um, the strict variation in which deprecated elements are forbidden and if you actually used a deprecated element, um, often the page itself wouldn't render at all. Transitional in which deprecated elements are allowed and frame set in which mostly frame related elements are allowed um, and it was uh, phase out, uh, phasing out visual markup features in favour of um, things like CSS. So CSS was fairly new back then too. 1998 Section 508 was released in the US and Section 508 is really important because it really put accessibility on the map from a policy perspective. Um, Bill Clinton signed the Workforce Investment Act into law uh, which is basically Section 508, which required accessibility for electronic and IT uh, systems for all federal purchases. And the W3C, um, as a result, started working on WCAG 1. So a year later, WCAG 1 was released, which was really quick. Um, it had 14 guidelines and 65 checkpoints, and it was often seen to be too complex, which is hilarious. Uh, and it was not technology independent. It referenced things like client side and server uh, side image maps. It didn't allow click here links, etc. So I'm going to read you the priority one checkpoints, which are basically the level A checkpoints of WCAG 1. Uh, so you can understand uh, kind of what we were dealing with back then. So uh, in general, Priority 1, 1 1.1, provide a text equivalent for every non-text element, e.g. via alt, long desk or in element content. This includes images, graphical representations of text, including symbols, image map regions, animations, e.g. animated GIFs, applets and programmatic objects, ASCII art, oh, remember ASCII art, frames, scripts, images, you, sorry, images used as list bullets, spaces, graphical buttons, sounds played with or without user interaction, standalone audio files, audio tracks of video and video. So that was 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, it's the most complex of all of them. Uh, 2.1, ensure that all information conveyed with colour is also available without colour, for example, from context or markup. 4.1, clearly identify changes in the natural language of a document's text and any text equivalents, e.g. captions. 6.1, organise documents so that they may be read without style sheets. For example, when an HTML document is rendered without associated style sheets, it must still be possible to read the document. 6.2, ensure that equivalents for dynamic content are updated when the dynamic content changes. 7.1, until user agents allow users to control flickering, avoid causing the screen to flicker. 14.1, use the clearest and simplest language appropriate for a site's content. 
So that was the general checkpoints. And then you have the, and if you use images and image maps checkpoints. Uh, 1.2, provide redundant text links for each active region of a server side image map. And 9.1, provide client-side image maps instead of server-side image maps, except where the regions cannot be defined with an available geometric shape. And if you use tables, 5.1 for data tables, identify row and column headers. 5.2 for data tables that have two or more logical levels of row or column headers, use markup to associate data cells and header cells. And if you use frames, title each frame to facilitate frame identification and navigation. And if you use applets and scripts, ensure that pages are usable when scripts, applets, or other programmatic objects are turned off or not supported. If this is not possible, provide equivalent information on an alternative accessible page. And if you use multimedia, uh, 1.3, until user agents can automatically read aloud the text equivalent of a visual track, provide an auditory description of the important information of the visual track of a multimedia presentation. And 1.4, for any time paced uh, multimedia presentation, e.g. a movie or animation, synchronise equivalent alternatives, e.g. captions or auditory descriptions of the visual track with the presentation. And the very interesting last checkpoint in priority one, level A, and if all else fails, 11.4. If after best efforts you cannot create an accessible page, provide a link to an alternative page that uses W3C technologies, is accessible, has equivalent information or functionality, and is updated as often as the inaccessible original page. And that's uh, that's where things get really interesting. So this is why we often see uh, things that seem to be okay, like separate sites for people with disabilities. Um, and that's where this comes from, this WCAG 1 checkpoint. And it's actually not allowed in WCAG 2. Uh, so that's something that, uh, you know, you can sort of see how it's progressed in that way. But it's definitely not something that you should be implementing now. Uh, and 2001, VPAT 1.0 was released, um, which was developed in partnership with the US Government General Services Administration and Information Technology Industry Council. So that's a US thing. Um, and one of the reasons why that was um, created was because a year before, in the U year 2000, there was the first web accessibility litigation, and it occurred in Australia. Bruce Maguire, who is a Sydney man and is vision impaired, wanted to buy tickets to see the Sydney Olympic Games. Uh, and so he couldn't buy tickets and he complained to SOCOG, which is the Sydney Operation Operating Committee of the Olympic Games. They ignored him. So he went to uh, the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, which is now called the Australian Human Rights Commission. And... Uh, they talked to SOCOG and SOCOG ignored them, so it ended up in court. So the case itself was based on three, uh, sorry, two major issues. One, they used JavaScript for navigation, and back then screen readers couldn't interpret JavaScript, so you needed to have a kind of backup alternative if you ever used JavaScript. And instead of having coded tables of results, they had screenshots of tables. Uh, so basically, SOCOG uh, in court argued that it would cost $16 million to make the site accessible. Uh, the judge fined them $20,000 because he deemed it would cost would have cost $10,000 to make the site accessible, and he doubled that figure. However, he awarded attorney fees to Maguire and Harriok, and they were in excess of half a million dollars. So SOCOG was up for the $20,000, but also up for the half million of attorney's fees for uh, Herioc and also, of course, their own attorney's fees. And they flew out experts from the US um, to talk about how difficult it would be to make the site accessible. The interesting thing, I was working in accessibility at that stage uh, at a company called Sausage Software, which was the very first WYSIWYG, so what you see is what you get, um, uh, HTML editor. Uh, and it hit the front page of every newspaper in Australia. Um, and around the same time, 
a little bit related, I joined the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Working Group and we started working on WCAG 2. Uh, 2002, uh, Firefox was first released, uh, which is a great browser um, and really uh, made things a lot easier uh, because really IE uh, was taking was running the show at that point. Uh, and then we had the, the very weird situation of the Watwig and the uh, the HTML text working group. So in June 2004, the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, which is the Watwig, was formed in response to the slow development of web standards by the W3C. So you might have noticed that back in 99, HTML4 was released. However, you know, it's 2004 and there's still no HTML5. This is because the W3C was really looking at XHTML and XML, which of course died a slow death. Uh, but they basically this, this group formed outside the W3C to uh, work on HTML. And this is something that, as you can see, happens quite a lot in accessibility. Uh, you know, the first accessibility guidelines uh, were created outside of policy. Uh, I'm working on a set of mobile guidelines at the moment outside of uh, policy groups like the W3C. And uh, it's something that tends to happen when we feel that, uh, you know, policy is not keeping up with the IT of accessibility. Uh, so basically, XHTML uh, was too unforgiving uh, in terms of error handling. So if you broke, if you re if you wrote your XHTML a little bit incorrectly, once again, you just get a page that wouldn't render. And I mean, the whole point of the web is rendering pages. So it was just something that uh, was not particularly helpful. So in 2006, the first public draft of WCAG 2 was released. Uh, and it was quite controversial for a number of reasons. Uh, the first reason was the testability requirement, which they still uh, require. Uh, I actually wrote a list of, an Alista part article uh, called Testability uh, Costs Too Much. Uh, and basically the concept of testability is that eight out of 10 accessibility specialists agree on the outcome. So it's not about automated testing, but you, as you know, you put you know, 10 accessibility specialists in a room, you'll get 10 different answers. It's really hard for us all to agree. And so that was kind of my argument with testability is that uh, it's something that you just, you just can't reach. And so it made, it was the reason why certain requirements that were in WCAG 1 were not included in WCAG 2. So for example, the clear and simple checkpoint ensured that your content is clear and simple was relegated to level three, which does not need to, or AAA, um, which does not need to meet testability requirements. And as I like to say, AAA is where success criterion go to die. So I, we were a number of people were quite unimpressed that the clear and simple checkpoint uh, had been relegated to AAA and the reasoning was this testability. And my argument was, you know, testability, you know, you couldn't meet it on whether an alt attribute was accurate, you couldn't meet it on whether captions were 100% accurate, etc. So it was not something that you should, uh, you know, decide as to whether a requirement should be in AA or AAA. Um, because the clear and simple checkpoint got uh, moved to AAA, Lisa Seaman lodged a formal objection of which about 35 to 40 accessibility specialists co-signed, including myself. And her formal objection was that WCAG 2 did not address the needs of people with cognitive disabilities. Uh, as a result of that formal objection, WCAG 2 was pulled from um, public release. And Basically, uh, the working group split in a little bit of a way. Uh, now, in the the guidelines that were finally released, there is actually a section which says that WCAG 2 does not accurately or sufficiently uh, make things accessible for people with cognitive disabilities. So instead of actually changing WCAG 2 to improve uh, things that people with cognitive disabilities may require, they just added this clause that says, hey, WCAD 2 is not sufficient. You need to do other things as well, uh, which is a bit unfortunate. 
However, before WCAG 2 was released, uh, as I said, this um, uh, WCAG version in 2006 was pulled from public release and a small group of accessibility specialists worked on something called the WCAG Samurai Rata. And basically, this was run by Joe Clark, who was very big in accessibility at the time, doesn't really um, uh, work in accessibility now. And he said, instead of creating a WCAG 2, what we need to do is create a WCAG 1.1. And so basically, he got together a group of anonymous accessibility specialists and they wrote a WCAG 1.1, which they called the WCAG Samurai Rata. And he got a couple of accessibility specialists to present a third party review of the document. And I was one of those specialists um, in terms of uh, reviewing what we thought was good and what we thought was bad. And if you do enough searching, you can still find that on the web. Now, WCAG 2 was published in 2008 and I published a blog post called why I'm still using WCAG 1. But, you know, after a year or two, I did jump on the WCAG 2 bandwagon um, as they fleshed out the, you know, understanding the success criteria sections and things like that. But it was very controversial. Now, in between that time, really interesting thing happened. Apple released their iPhone. And so it was the first real smartphone. I mean, I used... Um, Palm pilots and things like that, which I thought were fantastic. But, you know, I had to synchronize it with my computer through a cable when I got home and it was monochrome. Um, and even though when I, I was on the working group, what we wanted to do was ensure that the WCAG 2 were the last web content accessibility guidelines, we really tried to make them technology neutral, which is why you've got some very generic language uh, in WCAG 2. We really kind of wanted to make sure that whatever technology came along, um, you could apply WCAG 2. However, of course, when the majority of WCAG 2 was written, there was no iPhone, there were no native apps um, and the kind of ways that we see people use the internet now through their smartphones, we just had not conceived of. And so really, even though Apple released in 2007, it took a few years before native apps really, you know, um, started. And so WCAG 2 really kind of missed that, unfortunately. Um, and 2008, Watwood published their first public uh, work, uh, working draft, uh, which was then closely followed by the W3C follow, uh, publishing HTML5. So there's a real controversy between the two. Um, uh, basically, eventually HTML5 took over. Uh, 2008, WCAG 2 was published. For very busy first 10 years. Uh, and 2008, the W3C begins work on this thing called ARIA, which is Accessible Rich Internet Applications. So ARIA is not a true programming language, but a set of attributes that you can add to HTML elements to increase their accessibility. Uh, you know, these uh, attributes communicate role, state and property to assistive technologies via access accessibility APIs found in modern browsers. Uh, and this communication happens through the accessibility tree. However, it's really important for people using ARIA to know that if there are ways that you can uh, use HTML to do the same things, then you need to use HTML because HTML has accessibility built in and HTML is available to everyone, not just assistive technologies. So for example, your alt attribute on your image is the standard HTML way of providing an alternative text of the image. You don't want to use ARIA described by because ARIA described by is only available to people who use assistive technologies. And you might say, oh, but only assistive technologies need to use the alt attributes. And that's not the case. There might be some people that want to browse with images disabled due to, say, security concerns, and they're not going to be able to access the ARIA described by, but they are going to be able to access the alt attribute. Um, so that's why it's really, really, really important to use HTML when you can and not use ARIA. In 2008, Chrome was first released. Chrome, I love Chrome. Um, before Chrome, I was using Opera uh, because Opera allowed you to have multiple tabs open. 
Um, I actually released a newsletter. Uh, it had about 5,000 um, people that I sent it to from about uh, 2004 to 2006. I released it monthly and it was like the latest on accessibility. And in order to do that, I would go through all the links that I'd been sent. I'd open up all in the browsers. I'd read through them and decide which ones um, were, uh, you know, necessary to be included. Uh, and of course, if you <laughs> open, you know, 40, 50 um, uh, IE versions, that's going to crash your computer. But Opera, you can have multiple tabs. And when Chrome came, first came out, it had tabs as well, and I switched over. Another interesting thing that happened in uh, 2008 is Target in the US sue was sued by the National Federation for the Blind. Now, Target argued that there was a lack of alt text, that online purchases required a mouse, there were inaccessible image maps, I mean, seriously, 2008, um, headings missing, and uh, basically they uh, formed a class action lawsuit. They had been complaining since 2005 and had just been given the runaround, which is very common when it comes to accessibility complaints. And Target basically argued that because they the website was not... Uh, connected to a single physical location because it's under the Accommodations Act that you sue people in the US. Um, and they argued, therefore, it doesn't need to be accessible. Uh, the judge found that that was not the case and they ended up settling out of court. Now, they settled uh, for damages of $6 million and they also had to pay NFB's legal fees, which were in excess of $3.5 million. And they also had to get NFB to test their website for a very hefty fee every year afterwards. So they, um, uh, they're looking at about $10 million, which is a huge amount of money uh, for a, an organisation, uh, for any organisation. And so basically that really uh, turned people on to accessibility again, a little bit like how the accessibility litigation in 2000 did. Um, in Australia. Um, in 2009, the W3C went XHTML. We have decided that that's not a great idea and decided that they would continue HTML5 um, only. And then the most important thing happened, which was 2011 Accessibility Oz was founded. And although uh, 2011 Accessibility Oz was founded, another small thing happened that year which was Twitter, Twitter, who would have thought it, released the first CSS framework, Bootstrap. Uh, and basically Bootstrap is, uh, as a CSS framework was an open source project. In 2002, Bootstrap 2 was released with a 12-column responsive bridge layout, which is why you see that everywhere, alongside many other new features. And in 2013, Bootstrap 3 was released, which uh, had redesigned components and had a mobile first design philosophy. That's over a decade ago. Uh, and this is why it's really interesting, once again, that if you are outside of policy organisations, you can actually get things released pretty quickly. Um, and that you have organisations like Twitter, seems really strange, um, you know, moving the accessibility needle. Uh, 2012, Netflix was sued by the National Association for the Deaf. And this is the first time, once again in the US, that a company was, a, was sued that didn't have a public location. And so Netflix argued quite a lot of things as to why they didn't need to provide captions to their content, even when there was captions. So they firstly argued that uh, they didn't have to because uh, there was a uh, they weren't a public location. And then they argued that if they provided uh, captions, it would be a copyright violation. Uh, so the judge kind of said, that's not a very good defence in judgy words. And he requ required that Netflix provide captions within uh, 24 months uh, and uh, awarded the two complainants $795,000 uh, in damages. Uh, and so what's interesting about that is in 2015, a TV show called Daredevil was released, which is about a blind superhero. And you'd think perhaps blind people would like to watch a TV show about a blind superhero. And it was released without audio descriptions. Now, captions are for people who are deaf 
audio descriptions are for people who are blind or vision impaired. And there's a real difference between how people or how policy deals with captions versus audio descriptions. So in the US, everything needs to be captioned. You need to provide captions for all your content, uh, TV, cable, everything. Whereas you only need to provide 20 hours of audio described content um, uh, for per, say, cable company or something like that, uh, 20 hours a week, uh, which is very, very peculiar. And this, you saw that as well in WCAG 1. Uh, so WCAG 1 required, sorry, WCAG 2. Uh, WCAG 2 required that captions are provided at the bottom level, at level A, and only required audio descriptions at the double A uh, level. So it is something that is peculiar um, about the accessibility industry that audio descriptions are not seen on par with captions. So in 2015, um, this TV show was released in its entirety about a blind superhero without audio descriptions. And there was a bit of a kerfuffle <laughs> in the accessibility industry and Netflix actually provided audio descriptions for Daredevil within three days of its release. And the audio descriptions are absolutely excellent. So if you ever want to see uh, here um, really good audio descriptions, then have a look at um, Daredevil, and it's absolutely impossible to get audio descriptions for that much content done in three days. So there is a small minority of the accessibility industry who think that maybe it was a bit of a stunt on Netflix's part to uh, kind of get a bit of publicity. They say uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity. And then in 2012, uh, Watwick and the W3C decide to cooperate. So there's a few years there of to and froing, and so the W3C took over the HTML5 specification and decided to focus on a single definitive standard, HTML, uh, HTML, and it was considered as a snapshot of Watwig. So the Watwig um, does actually continue its work with HTML and is seen as a living standard. So Watwig actually talks about things that um, browsers might start to support but aren't actually included in the snapshot version of HTML5. So that's how the two different two are different. In 2013, uh, in May, at a JavaScript conference in the US, a new library called React was um, introduced. It was created by Jordan Walk, who's a software engineer working for Facebook. Once again, strange companies to be pushing the accessibility envelope. Uh, so basically, uh, existing CSS frame frameworks, even such as Bootstrap, Bootstrap, also built things like versions for React. And today, React is the most popular JavaScript technology. Unfortunately, it's not very accessible. Um, so there is that, that problem. Uh, a year later, Coles was sued in Australia. And so this is an interesting story. So basically, uh, a woman vision impaired again uh, in Sydney, again, Giselle Manage, she uh, had been working for several years with Coles to make their systems accessible. And in early 2014, she could finally do some online grocery shopping and get it delivered to her door. And then mid-2014, Coles released a new app and a new website which was not accessible. And Giselle was understandably annoyed. So she went um, to the, she complained, uh, which Coles did nothing. So she went to the Australian Human Rights Commissioner who had been assisting her with um, talking to Coles, but the coalition government had at that point retrenched or laid off the Disability Discrimination Commissioner from the Australian Human Rights Commission. Now, 47% of all complaints the Australian Human Rights Commission receive are regarding disability, and they have a lot of commissioners, like aged care commissioners, uh, gender commissioners, racial equality commissioners, sexuality commissioners, etc. And, you know, it's really kind of strange to retrench the uh, commissioner that is responsible for the most number of complaints, but that's what they did back in 2014. So Giselle had no other option than to actually sue Coles, so she did. Now, they settled out of court uh, for an undisclosed sum, uh, and Coles then went on to work very hard to make their content accessible. 
But once again, it was another thing that basically lit a fire when it came to accessibility. Another thing that happened in 2014 was EN301549. I mean, seriously, they really need to get a better name. And it was about the public procurement of uh, ICT products and services in the EU. So this is basically the Section 508 of Europe, except it also includes a whole lot of other things as well. And when it says, hey, you need to make your websites accessible, clearly I'm paraphrasing, it references WCAG 2. So it's basically now at a stage where WCAG 2 is seen to be the standard across the world. Uh, in 2014, Way ARIA 1.1 was released, sorry, 1.0 was released. Once again, takes a long time to do anything in the W3C. And at the same time, the BBC released their mobile accessibility guidelines. And so basically, the one thing about these guidelines is the first mobile accessibility guidelines to be released is that they merged the native app and mobile site requirements. So you never really knew uh, whether it was something you needed to apply to a native app only or to a mobile site. But these were seen as the de facto mobile accessibility guidelines for quite some time until uh, about 2019, 2020, the BBC came out and said, we never expected anyone to actually use these guidelines. We just released them, you know, so people would see what it is that we follow um, and you should really be considering other things, you know, like e-commerce that aren't covered by these guidelines. But for many years, the BBC mobile accessibility guidelines were what people followed. Um, the same year, HTML5 was released uh, and it was basically a very concerted effort by the W3C HTML working group and it included things like audio and video tags and made things like audio and video much more accessible. Uh, same year, Way ARIA 1.1 was released and you also got the VPAT 2.0 in the US. And then in 2008, uh, 18, WCAG 2.1 was released. So it did address issues around um, the requirements of people with cognitive disabilities and low vision because they, um, they were left out of WCAG 2. Uh, however, there was one thing uh, that a number of uh, mobile accessibility guidelines agreed on that uh, weren't really addressed properly by WCAG 2.1. So by 2018, all the big accessibility companies, uh, Accessibility Oz included, had their own mobile accessibility guidelines. And uh, one of the things that we all agreed on was that touch target sizes were needed to be a sufficient, you know, largish size. Um, and so that requirement was in WCAG 2.1. However, it was relegated to AAA. Um, and as I said, AAA is where success criterion go to die. And so that was something that the industry itself was uh, fairly unimpressed about, um, something that we all thought was really important that had just kind of been, we felt, ignored by the W3C. Uh, and so why do we need this WCAG 2 thing and why did I go on to work on mobile accessibility guidelines? So before we talk about WCAG 2.1, we need to talk about WCAG 2. So WCAG 2 success criteria are applicable to mobile, so mobile sites or native apps or whatever. However, not all aspects of mobile accessibility are specifically covered by WCAG 2. We really tried, but we didn't uh, make it particularly, we didn't make it perfectly technology neutral. So for example, although WCAG 2 requires sites to be accessible to the keyboard user, it does not specify that it should also be accessible to the touchscreen user. So as a result, and because uh, things were moving very slowly with WCAG 2.1, uh, in 2018, we, uh, well, 2017, we formed a group called the uh, ICT Mobile Site and Native App Testing Methodology Subcommittee. And we did this because in 2017 at the ICT Accessibility Testing Symposium, which is a conference aimed at accessibility testers, we all got together at the end and talked about what it is that the industry needed. And basically what we required was a standard set of mobile accessibility guidelines because you got different things if you went to different companies. So we knew that WCAG 2.1 would be released at some point. Um, so we thought this was a short-term issue. We thought WCAG 2.1 would address all our requirements. 
we were wrong. And so we knew we just wanted to make sure until that happened, we were all working off the same kind of guidebook. So what we did is we amalgamated everyone's mobile testing guidelines and put them into a nice you know, pretty order, and we released them in 2018 and around the same time that WCAG 2.1 um, was released. So WCAG 2.1, great. It did build on uh, WCAG 2, address more criteria related to touch screens such as pointer gestures, sensors, small screen devices. However, the accessibility industry really didn't feel like it covered all the user needs related to mobile accessibility. Of course, touch targets sizes being the largest one. So we reformed the committee and the second ICT mobile site and native app testing methodology was released in early 2020. Uh, and so that was something that you can still get. It's on the Accessibility Oz website. We're thinking of reforming the committee to write a new version. We did kind of get, you know, um, waylaid by COVID. Uh, but that is something that we do as a company follow. And a lot of the large accessibility companies were involved in their development in that development as well. In 2020, VPAT 2.4 was also released, which incorporated WCAG 2.1. And then, of course, you know, the end. What happened in 2020? Nothing happened after in uh, March 2020. Nothing happened after March 2020. Basically, COVID really threw a spanner in everyone's works. There was a real belief that uh, it would be, uh, you know, a new age of accessibility uh, in terms of everyone having to go online. You no know, people ran out of money and accessibility, once again, was the thing that dropped off people's lists, unfortunately. Uh, basically, in April 2022, WCAG 2.2 was released. Actually, hold on a second. No, it wasn't April 2022. It was September 2022. No, it was November 2022. No, February 23. No, April 23. No, June 23. These are all the times that the W3C said WCAG 2.2 would be released. Uh, June 2023, Way Aria 1.2 was released, which was great. Uh, October, we had 2.2 release, uh, 23, which is the case, which is great. Um, and it did have a few additional things that did improve uh, accessibility. So that is something that we are happy about. However, there were some things that we were not happy about. But let's start about with the things that we were happy about. So touch target sizes were, there was a new requirement added to AA, which required touch target sizes a little bit smaller than the version in AAA, um, but we all counted that as a win. Another thing that was included was dragging movements, which was something that was in the ICT Accessibility Testing Symposium mobile site and native app accessibility guidelines. Got to be a shorter way of saying that. Um, so we were happy to see that included in WCAG 2.2. However, the big one was a uh, success criterion 4.1.1, passing was removed. Now, what is passing? A lot of people have no idea what passing is. So the success criterion reads, in content implemented using markup languages, elements have complete start and end tags, it, tags, tags, tags. Let me start again. In content implemented using markup languages, elements have complete start and end tags. Elements are nested according to their specifications. Elements do not contain duplicate attributes and any IDs are unique except where the specifications allow these features. How on earth are you supposed to test this? Like go through and look at every single tag, open tag, go, does it have an end tag? There is an easy way to do this, which is called validation. So HTML validation, and it was a mainstay of WCAG 1. Uh, and it was a really easy way to determine if something wasn't accessible. You throw it through the validator, the validator spits out all these errors. You go, hey, this site is not accessible. However, because a whole lot of uh, companies were creating these WYSIWYG, uh, creating HTML through WYSIWYG editors, they were finding that the HTML that was output was not passing the validation. So in WCAG 1, you had a requirement for validation, but in WCAG 2, you don't have a requirement for validation. You have a requirement for passing. 
Now, validation is one way to meet the passing requirement, but it is not uh, the only way. So you could have people argue that their page doesn't validate, but they still pass, pass, P-A-S-S, -S, pass the passing requirement, uh, because who would ever know? So this has meant that uh, it was an easy way to check, but it also meant that you could easily tell where the code was uh, created properly so it could easily be interpreted by things like browsers or assistive technologies. Um, and so they decided to remove it in WCAG 2.2, which has split the accessibility community a little. Uh, there are people like myself who think that passing is important and there are other groups that think that it's an unnecessary test that needs to be performed. So that's, once again, one of the many controversies of accessibility. So thank you very much for coming to this talk. I am sorry I can't be there in person. I hope you learnt something. Please don't um, be offended if I did offend you. I did not mean to. It has been a very interesting 20 too many years, 26 years in the accessibility industry. Um, and it's something that, I mean, I love with a passion, but uh, the politics can be a little bit too much for me sometimes. Uh, so once again, thank you for listening to my TED Talk. Thank you for listening to my Drupal South Talk. And uh, please reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you.